So as we know, in programming, we have classes. A class can be seen as a coded representation of a real life object. In a class, we have variables and methods. In this class employee, we have the variables employee ID, employee name, and employee salary, which are attributes which can describe aspects of an employee. We also have the public method increase salary, which allows one to increase the employee salary from outside of this class. Now, if for example, we wanted to gain access to the variables and methods of the employee class from outside of the employee class, what we would do is create an object of employee in that external class using the code shown here. What we see here is the keyword new being used to call the default constructor in the employee class to create a space in memory for an instance of an employee object. So just to recap, when I don't have a user-defined constructor in a class, Java implicitly sets a default constructor, which looks something like this. Now getting back to the object of employee being created, what happens is that the new keyword calling the constructor creates a space in memory that can store the variables of an employee object, as well as holds the code for the methods of the employee class. Employee1 is used as a reference variable to hold the address of this space in memory. You would then use the employee1 reference variable to gain access to whatever you need from that section of memory. For example, I would gain access to the increase salary method and increase the employee's salary like so. While we have default constructors, we can also have user-defined constructors like the one seen here. When using a constructor like this, for a user to create an object of the employee class, a user must pass in the required values to satisfy the conditions of the constructor to successfully create an object in memory. For example, here I create an employee object in memory with an employee ID of 001, a name of John Goodworker, and a salary of 300,000. This creates an employee object in memory with pre-populated values. Now, in a similar way, we can also create an array of objects in memory like so. Here we see the new keyword creating space for three employee objects in memory. The three employee objects are stored adjacent to each other. The reference variable employee array stores the memory address of the first object in that array. So if we wanted to interact with the object in the first memory address, we would add zero to the address stored in the employee array. If we wanted to interact with the object in the second memory address, we would add one to the address stored in the employee array. And if we wanted to interact with the object in the third memory address, we would add two to the address stored in employee array. Now at this point, we have only set up empty space for three employee objects in memory. To actually populate these spaces with concrete employee objects, we have to use the new keyword to call the constructor for the employee class and pass in the values that we want for each object in memory, like so. So what we see here is the first space in the employee array containing an employee with an ID of 001, a name, John Goodworker, and a salary of 300,000. In the same way, we have Sarah's information in the second position in memory and roses in the third. We can also use an array list in the same way like so. The array list uses an array as its underlying data structure, however, has the benefits of being able to increase its size as it wants, as well as have access to many more helpful methods. This brings us to our exercise. To download the code for this tutorial, Please click the link below, which takes you to a GitHub page 
where you can download the project. If you need help with this, please watch my video on opening a project in NetBeans found in the link below. In this project, we have three files, the dog class, an enum file which stores the dog types, and the main class where we will create our array of dog objects. In the dog class, we have the variables name, age, and an enum dog breed. This enum can be found here. Using an enum allows for type safety. That is, it only allows for a predefined set of values to be inputted for the dog type, which helps prevent errors and improves consistency in the code. The dog class also has a user-made constructor, which populates the variables in that class when it is called. Now, moving on to the main class, we have three arrays, all containing 11 elements. The first array contains 11 set of dog names. The second contains 11 ages for those 11 dogs. And the third contains 11 breeds for those 11 dogs. What we would like to do is create an array of 11 dog objects using the values in the three arrays. So for example, the first dog object would have the name found in the first position of the dog array, the age found in the first position of the age list array, and the breed found in the first position of the dog breeds array. The second dog would be made up of the elements found in the second position of each array, and so on and so forth. Now, while this can be done manually, I'm going to use a for loop to iterate through each array and create an array of dog objects. When this for loop has completed, I will have 11 dog objects in the dog array, which all have names, ages, and breeds. In the dog class, we also have a print dog information method. If we run this method on every dog in the dog array, we get the output shown here. Now this brings an end to part one of our series on arrays of objects. The exercise done here really acts as a primer to part two, where we will go into more depth covering the use of deleting, searching, and updating objects in a list. We will also be using an array list instead of a standard array. This brings us to the end of this video and part one of arrays of objects. I look forward to seeing you in part two. Thank you for watching.